Okay, today, guys, I'm off to see a guy called David Atkinson, who actually owns a 600 limousine. So in the second part of the Mercedes 600 W100, I'm going to go and see his, show you around it in detail, and he said he could take us for a test drive as well, which would be great, just to give you a feel of what it was like to ride him on as well. Um, and here's one for you guys. I got an interesting message through the week of a guy from South Africa, and I don't know whether you remember, one of the three cars I owned was like a greyish brown one. And he said he actually knows the car. He said it belonged to none other than Pick Bota, who um, was in the National Party under President de Klerk in like the late 80s, early 90s. He served under him. But during the time, he gave this famous speech where he said, one day to be a black president of South Africa. And when that day comes, he'll serve under him. So it was very controversial, very colourful. Um, and I think if you look at the car, you'll see like a, a chrome flag stand on the front wing, which shows it was either a presidential car or a government car of, of some sort. And remember I explained that it had an air conditioning system that was specially designed for German warfare. How interesting is that? So it's actually got Pick Bolter's DNA in. And the flip side of the coin is, you know, it could also have the clerk's DNA in. But... You know, it's what shapes us, I suppose, and reminds us of the atrocities that have happened in the past. So, um, anyway, enough of that. Let's get off to Abergelly and see this 600. Hi, David. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing Good all right. Good to see you. Yeah. So, this wow. is it. I've missed this, I tell you. Because you know what, <laughs> I used to own three of these. Um, one was from South Africa, uh, one was from Ireland, and another one was a UK car that I oh, spent so, some time in Australia. So all right-hand drive. All then. right hookers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was very keen to get a right-hand drive when yeah. I got this. Well, it's a big car, isn't it? And I think if you had a left-hand drive on these roads the way they are, it'd be a bit of a tall order, wouldn't it? It, it would be. It would be tricky. But um, I think it's more that in this country we drive right-hand drive cars, so a left-hand drive just wouldn't quite seem right. No, it would be too much of a compromise. No, they're really ostentatious. But I think the short wheelbase, for some reason. It's almost like driving a modern car, isn't it? It doesn't yeah, feel it as big as it actually is. No, no. It's very easy to drive and quite remarkable for, for when they came out. You know, I mean, it's 1963 and it's disc brakes all round. Yeah. Um, air suspension, hydraulics for windows and doors and goodness knows what. You know, they're without doubt the most over-engineered cars ever, but, ever designed. Isn't they, it? they reckon that Mercedes lost money on every one. And when it was new, it was half as much again as a Rolls Royce. Yeah. I think Rolls Royces in the mid 60s are about eight or 10,000. When, when this came out, uh, Silver Cloud 3 was 6,000. Yeah. This was nine. Yeah. I thought it was more than that. And a lot of them, I suppose most of them went over to America, didn't they? Yeah. Like some Hollywood and that? Yes. Yeah. You've got the, uh, the, the Valor interior as well. Yes. No, I, I thought the Valor interior was a really expensive extra back in the day. Is that, is that right? Not that I'm aware of. I, I thought it was a no-cost option, but most people went for leather. One of mine had, um, it was leather at the bottom, and it was Valor on the top. It was like a mixture. So, I mean, maybe it was such that the car was a, a Valor interior to begin with. Because the and, door panels were half and half, which I, I can see yours are as well. Yes, yes. I've seen an American one where it's been changed to leather, and they've used the same pattern as they do on the Velour. So yeah. you can tell, looking at it, it used to be a Velour car. Just self-closing doors? Yeah. That's good. That's the last amazing, yeah. quarter of an inch. Because he did away with that, didn't he, in yeah. the yeah. about 67 or 66? When, well, on the later ones, with the flat headlights, um, and the um, the lever over the instrument bezel, yeah. um, and they don't have the wood on the um, on the door below yeah. the, the armrest. Do you know that apparently? I mean, I don't know whether this is true or not, but there was no two interiors exactly the same. There were supposed to be no two cars identical yeah. in spec. Yeah. 
but quite nice that, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. But but I mean, with only two and a half thousand produced over eighteen years, yeah, it's not surprising really. You know, that didn't used to bother me too much about the interior. You know, say you had a velour interior and then you you wanted to change it to leather, yeah, or you wanted to do half and half of the door panel. You could do whatever you want really because, you know, like I say. To begin with, there's no, or like we were saying, there's no two cars exactly the same. Yeah. So well, it gives you sort of license to and, make it and, personal. You know, and, you know. and, and they were all made to order. Yeah. So there were some that were bought by dealerships to put in the showroom, but they were all to the dealer's specification. Can so look at the engine. Yeah. This was Mercedes' first ever V8. I mean, everybody thinks, you know, Mercedes V8, that's, that's the norm nowadays. Uh, I've got this nice and clean, David. I love this. I actually made my battery trays. Well, not the trays, the, the when, covers. Well. When I bought the car, it didn't have a, a frame. Um, the battery was held in with um, zip ties. Um, and I got that from the States because most of the 600s that were produced went to the States. Yeah. Um, and then I was able to get the, the rods that hold it down from Mercedes. They still had them. Is this, so, this, this is like an old style type battery? Yeah, you, you, you have to get the, 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 the right side. When, when I got this battery, which was about a year ago. And tell me, come on, David, is it a Varta or have you just stuck that sticker on it? No, no, it is a Varta. <laughs> the, the one I had before was a Mercedes one. Yeah. But you can't get them from Mercedes anymore. They don't do them. Um, Bars are the best anyway, I think. Um, and I got that from a, a, a local battery place. They said it was in stock. I went to, to get it and they said, well, we haven't got one here. Yeah. And they, I, I saw this on the side and said, I think that's it. And they said, no, that's a commercial battery. That'll do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is your hydraulics, isn't it? If I can remember. That's for hydraulics. It's your power steering. That's yep. your pump, isn't it? That's for, your, uh, for, for the air. Air sus pump for the air yep. suspension. Yeah. And then there's a hydraulic reservoir runs along underneath the, the yeah. bottom. Yeah. It's a, it's a real faff. I remember doing the belts on these. And it's a real faff getting them and, and getting them to tighten up. You have to take this the, the front thing off. Yes. I can remember. And well, there are so, so many belts on it. It's. Um... I remember I had a... What did I do? I did something with the, with the, uh, the air suspension pump. And I, I did a lot of work with the belts and all that, and I couldn't get the car to come up on one of them. And I'd seen this little piece on the floor where it brushed up, and it was like a little kind of plunger. And all day I was trying to get it to work, and I was running the engine, it wasn't coming up. I went into the pile of rubbish, got this little plunger, cleaned it up, took it all apart, and eventually it, it had this spring that goes on. It was a you know, real kind of mm. faff getting it all to go together in the right order. But when it went, it was like suddenly the car came up. All day I was on it trying to do it. I know I saw one at auction as well. The only car I've ever sold at auction. And um, when the, the buyer went to, when it was delivered to him, it was on the deck. And somehow the auction house had broken something. Where was it? It was this. This thing. Right, yes. You literally, you know, like when um, a car's on view in an auction house and you get people saying, yeah. what's that? And they push things and pull things. Push. Yeah. Someone had snapped it right the way around. Oh. So it wouldn't it wouldn't go up or down. Yeah. I, I looked at a 300 SEL 6.3. Yeah. Um, and when that went to auction, the, the back wheel, it was right up on the suspension. The back wheels were tucked under because the, um, the, the, the joint had on the air suspension valve on for the rear wheels had come adrift yeah they, they work on little ball joints yeah well uh i think um i told the buyer to get uh, i organized them to go to ss motors in woking yeah. uh there's an old guy called joe an old italian guy who was the best guy in the country for for all these cars he was incredible and he owned brian forbes's you know the old producer oh, who was yes. married to nanette newman yeah he founded at Shep shepherdson studios and it had been sitting there for 15 years or something. It was all covered in rust and all the tyres were flat. And he restored the whole car. It was amazing. He had a 300 SEL. He had um, he had a coupe, a 3.5 coupe. He really knew his stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he's just retired now. Yeah, good old Joe. What a bonnet, eh? Look at this. 
I remember getting all mine re chrome and it was a phenomenal expense getting the bumpers and the grill and all yes. these other little well, bits and pieces. There's so much chrome on it. Yeah. They were just lavish with them, weren't they? Yes, yes. And remember the horn as well? Have you got the horn? How, how many horns do you need on a car? I know. Because it's got four. I know. It's like a tugboat, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. What a ship. Well, well, again, when I got the car, yeah. the, the air horn, which is under here, was missing. Yeah. But then it's got two tone horns and the loud horn for the autobahn. I remember which... seeing this car in um, a restoration place in, in Norwich, yeah. Yep. And it was missing then. And yes. I think he had told me, uh, the guy there told me that he'd found one and you were delighted or he'd found yes. one for you, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I bought one from uh, a collector in Germany. Yeah. Out of the three that I had, only one had the horn. Because mm. yeah. they just get stolen because you know how valuable yeah. these things are. Yeah. Should we go inside and have a little chat? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Get, get the kettle on, eh? Get the kettle on, David. <laughs> so this is the car as I bought it. And it has spotlights on the front, on, in the bumpers, and indicators uh, above the front wheels. So I have the wings uh, refurbished, and we took those off. That cost you a few bob, I'm sure. Oh, it did. They have this problem where, like, if you pull up and you get out the car and the engine's still running, you'd be yeah. talking to somebody, and suddenly the car will go past you and start yeah. driving yeah. away. Well, you just well, go into gear on their own. On, on this one, it went into reverse, backed into the, the chap's house, yeah, uh, and damaged the bumper. And this is and, the damage is done, yeah? Yeah, and it, and it cracked the uh, window behind. More importantly... It took me a year to get it sorted because yeah. I had to get a new bumper. Oh wow! Have it re-chromed. Um, Mercedes. Well, of course, you must have got it cheaper. What than Car. Mercedes? Yeah. Uh, he paid for the damage. Oh, that's good. So, which which was very honourable. Um, but I inquired of Mercedes. They said they didn't have any in stock. But if they had, centre section of the bumper, twelve thousand pounds. Chief. So you ordered two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't because they didn't have them. So I got a, a, a bumper from the States, yeah. had it uh, stripped, straightened, re -chromed, and put on the car. It's all money, isn't it? They yeah. are a money pit, but you know what? Well, for the leaking hydraulics, but all the problems we've talked about, worth every penny. The, the, that problem, you can always tell if the car's got the problem, because if you turn the wheel and the horn sounds, then it's it's got the problem. Yeah. Because I think, it's, I think it's the horn is broken on this one, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Not the only thing then. Yeah. Have a seat. Cheers. Lovely place you got here, David. It's very nice. What a view. Wow. Plenty of weather. Yeah. So tell me, David, what's uh, what brought you to buy a six hundred? I mean, you, you mentioned before that when you were a kid, you used to go <laughs> into the dealerships and that, and I, I noticed you've got your books there as well. So on them days, you could actually walk into the dealership yeah. and request one of these. This is for the Landolet. Yes, and, and they had different lengths of roof for the, the different ones. The presidential went forward to the behind the front. And the sunroofs, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some of them were there, just the last third, and, and some yes. were like uh, two-thirds or all of it, yeah. Yes. I've got a few of these books on different models. I've got the 111. The 108, the 115, uh, the 113. I've just picked them up over the years, you know, yeah. the kind of swap meets or, you know, classic car shows. And I'm always really excited when I find them on because they're getting pretty rare nowadays, aren't they? But you always wanted a 600 since yeah. you were a kid. Yeah. And eventually you were able to find one. And where did yes. you get it from? It came from Cambridge. There was a chap who um, collected cars. He had about 100 cars. Yeah. And he wanted to slim down his collection. The great thing about this car is mostly just sat in a shed, so it wasn't abused. Well, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Do you? I think if cars are used regularly, you very it's, rarely go wrong, but when you stop using them and then you use them after a long layup, that's when the problems start. Yes, but then if you have somebody who owns a car like that who doesn't have the money to maintain it, mm. then the whole thing will go pear-shaped. Yeah. 
I suppose so. But these cars, I mean, even when they were new, they came with a tool kit, didn't they? And it had yeah. like wooden pegs in case the windows collapsed. So they foresaw yeah. the car was flawed. They knew that they were so <laughs> over-engineered. So they knew things were going to go wrong. There was yeah. switches for the doors and windows and yeah. there was the hydraulic oil in the back. And there was all different bits and pieces, wasn't it? Because they, they, they saw there was going to be problems with them. And the main problems were always the hydraulics. Yes. And it'd take you ages. You'd buy new switches. You'd send them off to Germany and get them rebuilt if you couldn't get hold of them. And they'd come back, you know, several thousand euros later. You'd, you'd mend them. You'd mend a couple of pipes. And then you'd spring a leak somewhere else. But you know what? <laughs> all said and done, they were completely worth it. And I'd do it all over again. I really miss my... Lots of people don't realise that the fluid that goes in there looks exactly like brake fluid. Yeah. But if you put brake fluid in... Your rotten seals, mm. there are probably about a thousand of them in the car, and it would cost an oh, enormous it's a, it's amount. Oh, it's scrap, isn't it? It's yeah. scrap, yeah. Well, scrap. I've actually seen people put uh, ATF, yeah. you know, automatic transmission fluid in, and you think, what? Yes. I mean, it wouldn't do as much damage as brake fluid, but still, if you don't yeah. put the correct fluid in, you burst yeah. all the seals or they go hard. Exactly. And and Rolls-Royce have a similar problem where, when we got past a certain year, they went on to this, uh, this green fluid. Yes. And you have untold problems if you put the wrong fluid in, you know, you just, like, scrap the car. Yeah. All the yeah. brake system would be completely trashed. And, but, you know, people would get it wrong. I didn't find the 600s too bad to service. But the thing I did find was, on, on all three of them, when I took the rocker covers off, the camshafts were completely covered in surface rust. Because no. you've got a, a, a problem where the, the water pump just seeps water into the oil. Yeah. I dropped the oil on one of them, and literally half the container was water and half was oil. Ooh, that's and nice. this is what happens when the car sits up for a long length of time. Yeah. Um, so I hope you changed your oil as soon as you bought that. I did. <laughs> Before I started running it again. But yeah, on the first one, I found that. So each one, you know, subsequently, I'd, I'd take the rocker cover off, surface rust all over the camshaft, Clean them off carefully, yeah. blow it all, you know, wash it all off properly, cover them in oil again and rock a cover back on with a new seal and I never had any problems with them. No, but that's just because they sat up and the condensation, I suppose, you know. Yes, yes. I think they only made three cars in 63, you know. They did. And yes. then in 70, sorry, in 64, they made 73 cars, I believe. A third of the 600s that were imported into the UK came in in 1965. Yeah. They were making a, a good few by then, weren't they? Um, I think in 1963, they, they, they took it to the Geneva Motor Show. Yeah. And that's when three were built, and they thought, we'll see how it goes. And it just took off. Everyone ordered them, all the big hitters ones, the ones that Yes, yes. And I think most of them went over to Hollywood. I think that's probably right. I, well, I think that's where most of them probably still are. I think the first owner of mine was um, involved in television because the registration was an LTV, yeah. which was London Television. London, London Weekend Television, it was, yeah. LWT, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 What I found interesting about these cars, um, the ones I had anyway, two out of the three had the original engine in, uh, but one of them had an engine from a 300 SEL, left hand drive yes now i know the you know the, the 100 engine would do basically the same engines you put yes. in the 300 sel didn't they yes and i think you find a lot of them do have a 300 sel engine in because if anything went wrong you know 10 years down the line rather than the huge expense of a new engine do you find like a, a scrapped or a, a, a you know accident it's, damaged 300 sel and just put the engine straight in it was much it's, cheaper it's, it was a newer engine it's down to numbers there were two and a half thousand 600s produced yeah. about 7,500 SEL 6.3s. Yeah. So if you were looking for an engine, you're much more likely to find one from a 300 SEL mm. than you were one from a 600. Yeah. And it is the same engine, but some people are, are obsessed with the originality. Yes. And I think you can't really be that obsessed with, with 600s originality because, because of what we just talked about. One, but one, it's, it's interesting. I talked to this chap a few weeks ago uh, who still has the car. Um, and he said he, he's found one from a landerlet which belonged to a sheikh who yes. wanted to put a V12 in when it was yeah. nearly new. He, he wanted to put this, you know, brand new kind of more yeah. modern engine in. 
And at the engine removed, and he's now had that rebuilt, and he's fitting it into the 600 that he bought off me. There, there was one of the uh, Middle Eastern um, uh, rulers had a fleet of six, 600s yeah. and had more changed over to V12s. Yeah, well, it may, it's probably one of them, yeah. you know, what we're talking about. Um, and, I, you know, that's great, but, you know, it's, 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 it's his car, and it's how far you want to go. But, mm. you know, I think the engine that was in it was, was perfectly good. And I want to ask you about this. Do you find that the oil pressure always seems lowish on them? It like veers up and down very slowly. You know, like modern cars, you, you touch the accelerator and the, the oil pressure goes right up. On these, it just floats about. It just wafts about, doesn't it? And at first, when I started driving, I thought, has this got low oil pressure? But then I found out that they were all the same. They were all, it was just yeah. one of the, the yeah, little... Just, just the way... It, yeah, just the way they are. The amazing thing about these cars, for a 1963 design, the doors are self-closed. You know, people rave about self-closing doors in modern cars, but look at this. It just sucks it in, that last centimetre. See that? Beautiful. And you don't have to slam them. I've actually uh, seen a lot of these cars with a sign here, do not slam the door because you can completely wreck the hydraulics or you can damage the switches. So everything is just lovely and soft closing and, you know, nothing needs to be forced. Um, take a look at the boot. The boot's on a switch. You pull the switch, the hydraulics take it up. I mean, the pressure's a little bit low on this. You press the button in, and that should slam closed, but... Sometimes, you know, I, they've all got the little idiosyncrasies um, and I, I owned a blue one which had the same problem as this. You just have to push it that rest of the way. The other two are perfect, but, you know, hydraulics for you. Um, the cockpit and the seats. These were the, um, the Velour, which a lot of them have the Velour. Uh, the, if you look back at the old Rolls Royces, the chauffeur always had leather seats. And in the back, I'm talking like 20s, 30s, 40s Rolls Royces. The back seats were like, you know, the Draylon type seats. Because they were meant to be the luxurious one on the leather, but for the chauffeur, the bog standard. I know most people want leather seats, and I wanted leather seats, but personal preference, I suppose. Um, yeah, look at this as well. Look at the detail on the wood. Beautiful. Just quality. Nicely worn in as well. Door seals, nice and brand new. I didn't think these were still available from Mercedes-Benz, but apparently you can still get them. Take a look at the engine bay. Let's get where it was. Look at that. Start it up. Now these these engines are capable of like 130 mile an hour comfortably. That's hard to believe for such a huge car, what well, a couple of ton car. Just listen to that. 50 odd year old engine. Best engine they ever built. Look at this in the uh, cockpit. You've got your handbrake, which is here. You pull that to let it off. And I find when you go into park, it goes down on its own. When you drive off again, it comes up the pedal. It's like a ghost driving the car. Um, this is how you adjust the steering wheel. You can pull in or out, and you just tighten it up. All high-tech stuff for 1963. It still is. Simple. Beautiful. The size of these, they're like doors in themselves. Just pure luxury and comfort. I'll show you the windows.
mirrors. See, the mirrors are just on a simple wheel that you turn here. See? It just brings it in and out. Everything Mercedes did was complicated in design, so it was simple to operate and beautiful. It's just that there was so much of it. Every conceivable extra crammed into one car. Just checking you still got your teeth in there, David. <laughs> wow, what a view. Not really the kind of roads you, you want to be on in a car like this, but it's actually <laughs> eating it up, isn't it? Well, it's pretty good suspension. Talk me through these lights, David. What's that red one there? Um, I think that's the uh, alternator. Right. What, the belt's a bit slack or something? Could be. I replaced an alternator on one of mine. Um, to get it rebuilt, it would have cost me about three times what it cost me to buy new from Mercedes-Benz. Goodness me. It was one of those pleasant surprises, you know, when you think, yeah. really? That cheap? Well, there's not too many of from Mercedes anyway. One of the things I had to get for this was a, a rear wheel bearing. Yeah. A thing. But it's so big. Um, and it's eighteen hundred pounds. Well, you couldn't get a firm no. to, to make you one. No. Oh, it, I mean, it's quite a a complicated bit of kit. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I put um, a brand new screen from Mercedes Benz in the front of, of one of mine and in the rear as well because they were both broken. Did well to get it. Do you know what? I think it cost me at the time £1,800 for both of them. Goodness. Which I thought yes. was a bargain. That was with the VAT yeah. and everything, you know. Yeah. So some things do surprise you, you know, they're relatively cheap compared to, you know, other stuff will just blow yes. you away, like you said about the <laughs> wheel bearing. Yes. Well, the um, the, the little seals for the um, uh, hydraulics um, are £10 a throw. Yeah. And it's about a quarter of the size of a sixpence. Yeah. I, the thing is about them seals, the square edge. Yeah. And I tried to get some made up by, by a shop and they were round and they just wouldn't do the job. And I noticed with Mercedes seals as well, the second to not, they're a different kind, different quality of rubber. Yes. And if you, I find if you don't get them from the main dealer, it's curtains. It just doesn't work. You know, there's no longevity in the parts and, and they just don't hold the pressure, you know, they don't hold the pressure or, yes. or seal properly. So what's, uh, what's the quickest you've been in this? What's the quickest? On the motorway? Um, oh, uh, about 69.9, I think. Really? Might have been a bit more. There's no policeman watching this. <laughs> Come on, <tell> the truth. <laughs> I don't generally take it above 80. Yeah. They're very capable of doing 130 mile an hour though, you know that. Oh yes. It? Test drivers at Mercedes took one of these round a Nürburgring. Yeah, I believe so, Faster yeah. than a, a, a race driver could go round in a 230 SL. Yeah. For all these. Yeah, yeah, no, I got that from a chap in Holland who specializes in Beckers. It's actually slightly later than the car. Yeah, they do a thinner version yeah. of this, about yeah. centimetre thinner and slightly longer. So um, that's for the heater. Yeah. So this is the, the air conditioning. Yeah, air con. That's, that's your blower, pressure. isn't it? Yeah. You hear it yeah. click and then it... And then one for the left side and one for the right side. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Left and right. And then this is for the, um, the fresh air flap. That's for the fresh air flap and it comes yeah. up hydraulically as well. Yeah. This one actually does nothing, but if it yeah, it's a, just a dummy, isn't it? If it had a sunroof, then it would do the sunroof. That's right, yeah. Yeah, they thought of everything back then, didn't they? And it's got the coal mice there, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's... Um, it's an aftermarket, isn't it? That's aftermarket, a good one. Aftermarket, but it's the same as would be fitted um, in the factory, so... So majestic. Everyone just moves out the way. <laughs> audience there. So whilst riding beside David aboard Stuttgart's legendary 600 limousine and the sound of that 6.3 litre V8 engine powering effortlessly on country roads and hills brings back fond memories of its exclusive ownership and somewhat complicated maintenance. So after a big farewell and many thanks for a revisit of this special motor car. I skip away a happy man. Thank you for watching this episode of Gary Mather's Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. And join me next time when I travel up to Galloway in Scotland to find a very special collection of rare Series 1 E-Type Jaguars. <laughs>